Uma boa tarde aos participantes da 18ª Semana do Cravo. É com muito prazer que a gente dá início à segunda sessão, ao segundo dia de curso com Florence Getro. Então, uh, muito bem-vinda, Florence. Flor Dear Florence, uh, welcome. And so uh, we can start. Thank you so much being with us for, for your second course. Okay, so now, do, do you hear me good? Yeah? Very well. Eh? Well, Jose, Very well. Everything is good? Okay. So now I will uh, share my screen, if you agree. Yeah? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. It does not work. Marcello, ça ne marche pas. Yeah. Ça ne marche pas. Non. Tu as, euh, as appuyé sur as... partager. Partager, voilà. Et. Euh, Try PC. Again. Okay. ok, ok. Now it is good. Uh, no, I do not see it. I am sorry. Uh, tu veux essayer une autre fois? Non, mais surtout, il faut que je trouve mon, mon fichier. Oui. Voilà. Pourquoi est-ce que vous ne me voyez pas? Nous, nous te voyons, mais, mais pas ton, ton fichier, pas ton slide. OK. I, I have a message. Uh, le partage d'écran n'a pu démarrer. Veuillez réessayer ultérieurement. I, I should oh. try uh, later. Okay. Strange. Uh, mais mais peut-être tu tu peux appuyer une autre fois sur uh, partager. Encore une fois. Encore une fois, oui. C'est bizarre. Quand tu partages, tu vois un autre écran et après, est-ce que tu as, tu as appuyé sur ton fichier dans cet écran? Et en fait, mon fichier, il, est, il était ouvert sur le bureau et pourquoi il ne voilà. s'affiche pas? Alors, il faut, quand tu vois ton fichier dans, dans cet autre écran, il faut appuyer là. Pour, pour ouvrir, pour partager. C'est ce que j'ai fait hier, mais il ne s'affiche voilà. pas. Il ne s'affiche pas. Je pense que je vais tout fermer et recommencer. Voilà, oui. Peut-être c'est Je mieux. recommence tout. Bien. Je, je, je fais, même je quitte hein, et je viens vers vous. OK. Bon, mes amis, nous avons un problème technique ici. 
É, todo mundo que está trabalhando né, na pandemia já passou por isso, então, <risos> a professora Florence, a despeito da sua enorme experiência, é, também está tendo uns probleminhas. Né? É, é verdade que na Europa eles estão numa situação um pouco diferente da gente. Ela mencionou no nosso contato assim mais recente é, que ela tem participado mesmo de eventos presenciais. Né? Então, é, toda essa tecnologia é, muitas vezes ou não funciona ou a gente tem uma certa dificuldade. Né? Então, agora ela voltou, então vamos aguardar um pouquinho. Et en fait, il faut que je, je coupe la vidéo, hein, c'est ça? Euh, oui. non, non, je ne crois pas. Ton vidéo, non, je crois que ça... ça voilà. Ok. Là, vous me voyez? Je, oui. Et alors, partager. Et maintenant, je vais partager l'écran. Voilà, partager l'écran. Et, et, et tu maintenant, il est là. Maintenant, il est bien là. Voilà. Ok. Voilà. Est-ce que vous me voyez bien? Très bien. Et je mets plein écran. Très bien, merci. C'est bon? C'est bon. Alors on peut y aller. Alors, uh, I am happy to welcome everybody once again for the second session. And as you already know, the second session today is devoted to the harpsichord in France from the 17th century uh, to the, the end of the 19th century. Like yesterday, I would like to, um, to recall that many of very good articles were published in two international uh, journals. Uh, one journal is the Galpin Society Journal Uh, founded uh, in, in England. And uh, this journal is very specialized on organology, was founded by the famous uh, Galpin, who was a, a prominent scholar. And uh, more than 20 years later, American people decided to found another journal, also in English, the Journal of the American Musical Instrument Society. It means both are uh, today online in uh, GSTOR or anyhow in the RILM, it means the Repertoire International uh, de uh, Literature Musicale, uh, International Repertory for Musical uh, Literature. So if you have access in a musical library, you can read all the articles published in the Galpin Society Journal and in the American Musical Instrument Society uh, Journal. Uh, I would say also that, that uh, there is several um, journals specialized on keyboards uh, in English mainly, and uh, you should find them also in good uh, musical libraries. So uh, first look at the RILM database, then you have the references. And very often they are already today uh, attached with the reference and you can uh, get a PDF if you like. It is for me because of the subject of today also um, important to say that since uh, 95, I created a journal in French, uh, and not only in French, but also in English, uh, supported first by the Ministère de la Culture and later by CNRS editions. And we are now preparing uh, volume 18. It means there is uh, quite regularly a volume pro year, and several of them were devoted to French harpsichord builders or uh, harpsichord problems. And uh, you can see here volume two, a special volume. I think it is no more available because it had a very good success because we published inside many studies on uh, 17th century uh, Parisian and regional making in France. Uh, articles, for example, by 
uh, Monsieur Anselme, who is one of the very good makers and scholars in France. And we published also about regional schools like the Lyon School of uh, Making. And uh, we prepared twice with Denis Erlin, a colleague of mine, an article about uh, the portraits of harpsichordists and harpsichords. It means uh, the representation in painting or engraving of harpsichordists and my, uh, sometimes also uh, very uh, important harpsichord pictures. So um, go online. I, I, I give you here the link, you know, you can find uh, on the website of my research group, IREMUS, it means Institut de Recherche en Musicology, you can find the journal, all the titles, all the, the titles of the articles and abstracts in French and English. It means you can, before you work, look for what you need. And then when you know in which volume it is, you can all buy it by CNRS edition. And I give you the link. Or you can uh, find it on rilum.org. And very, uh, uh, you have all the article minus three years. You know, there is a, a barrier. And uh, each year when we have a new volume, uh, we give another volume to the rilum. So I am very happy about that system because it means it is online uh, if you have a musical library not too far from you. Okay, this is for uh, the bibliography. Now I will do like yesterday. I will try to, uh, to give some elements about the historiography and the very first documents on uh, the French uh, keyboards. Uh, what is very nice is this drawing in a manuscript at the end of the 16th century, a manuscript by Jacques Cellier. And he's giving the figure, or the, I would say the drawing of some instruments, not very many, but for example, uh, uh, bells and also uh, musical glasses, uh, wind instruments, etc. And inside there is a clavichord and there is a spinet. And what is nice is uh, with the spinet is giving us a fantasy uh, for the organ from Monsieur Costelet. So uh, you know the database Gallica from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Uh, is doing many, many, many uh, digitalization of, of books and manuscripts. And you can find this manuscript online if you want to uh, study the very early uh, story of French uh, keyboards. Very known from everybody is uh, this plate from Marin Mersenne in his Harmony Universelle, I am sorry, once again, uh, I mistaped. Uh, you see, it is a very, very small instrument, a rectangular with a, a keyboard inside the case. And uh, you see the date, it is 1636, but we don't have preserved instruments uh, with such an early date. Uh, we are, um, uh, I am found of archives documents and in the archives documents, for example, inventories after the death of musicians or of uh, uh, quite uh, uh, easy people with uh, some money, uh, till the middle of the 17th century, in the inventories, there is mainly only spinets very few, very, very few harpsichords. So two types of spinets are uh, uh, were built in France. The rectangular one, like in Mersenne, at the top of my screen. And this one is by a very famous dynasty, the, the dynasty Denis. They were makers, they were organists, and harpsichord and spinet players. 
And uh, the second one has a polygonal shape. The keyboard is not inside the case, but outside. And what is noticeable is um, they are made uh, in uh, uh, also, uh, Nussbaum, uh, Marcello, can you say? Uh, yeah, in klein moment, Nussbaum, uh, Nogera, Nogera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second aspect is that uh, it is imitating for the soundboard the way to paint and to give uh, uh, very lovely motifs with flowers and with birds and uh, with uh, sometimes insects. They are really lovely. And this is a type of imitation of uh, low countries, as you can imagine. We see also that the keyboards are uh, with ebony and, uh, and ivory. And uh, the front uh, of the keys are with a three, uh, uh, three lobes, uh, a three lobe. Huh? And this will be for all the 17th century, uh, a tradition in France. So two main uh, models. Uh, in the iconography, documents are quite scarce. Uh, I show you here a very interesting document. It is uh, near uh, Les Deux Sèvres, it is near the Atlantic. And in a schloss, there, in, a, in a castle, the castle of Warion, uh, there is a room devoted to the uh, muse. And one of the muse, Calliope, uh, is playing a spinet, as you can see. And uh, it is quite a unique document. We can see the jacks. It is lovely. And uh, <clears throat> it is also interesting for maybe the technique of playing. Another document uh, quite early is by Pierre Puget. Uh, showing uh, Saint Cecile. Uh, what is very strange in this very small picture preserved uh, in the native city of Puget. Puget was uh, born in Marseille and worked in, a lot in Marseille. He tried to work for Louis XIV and uh, he was not successful. And um, uh, for a long time, I wondered if it would not be a regal on the table, but I think it is a spinet, not very accurate. Uh, what is strange because we see a small lute and a cornetto. And uh, I think this, this painting is quite uh, bizarre. Uh, you see there is a, a man at the balustrade looking at Santa Cecilia and the sky is like if a, a miracle or, uh, was just uh, in, in, in procedure. So uh, anyhow, uh, it is uh, like yesterday, uh, the religious uh, inspiration for painters with Santa Cecilia at the keyboard. More interesting for us, I think, is uh, for the first half of the 17th century, this um, house concert uh, or music, uh, practiced uh, at home with several generations. You see a known man on the left, probably playing a uh, violone or uh, uh, grand bass d'archer. Uh, a lute player, a uh, very small violin, a uh, young man singing and a lady uh, playing a square uh, small spinet. As you can notice, it is like in Italy, uh, the case is covered with red leather. So uh, it is quite a, a nice document to see that it was played on a table with a, a rich uh, um, uh, tapestry, you know, and uh, this grouping of instruments with, with song is quite usual. Very often uh, at home, people were singing psalm, for example, and the painter worked in Toulouse, the city of uh, Thibault. We will have a, a moment uh, with Thibault later. And um, probably that family was Protestant. So maybe they, they, they are uh, singing a, a psalm uh, at home together. 
I love the, this painting. It is in the Louvre. It is really very, very important. Uh, as I told, harpsichords are very uh, seldom quoted in documents. But the very first preserved is uh, an instrument by Louis Denis. You see, still this uh, famous dynasty. It is dated 1648. And it is in Issoudun, a small city in the middle of France. <clears throat> uh, I hope you can see on the right of, of, the, <clears throat> of the screen uh, a black and white photo with uh, the instruments, I would say, in, in the, the state of today, with an 18th century stand. And I don't want to uh, know why the curator of the museum in, uh, in Issouda preferred this terrible wo wooden block, white block, instead of, uh, of the later stand. But I think uh, the later stand is, is not so ugly. And even if it is later made, uh, I don't understand why they suppressed it, let it in, in, in the storage. And OK, I am sorry for, for this ugly uh, <laughs> support of, of the instruments. <laughs> Uh, you, you see evidently that that instrument is no more in his very original uh, state. Uh, it was uh, decorated later and uh, there was some changes on it. But anyhow, it is a very important piece, the oldest in France and not in a bad condition. <clears throat> I, uh, I profit the opportunity to announce you that uh, the association uh, Clavecin en France, uh, I think uh, well known from uh, part of you, uh, is planning to <clears throat> build a copy of that instrument uh, for the purpose of sharing that instrument later with harpsichordists in France to give concerts. And there is a very good study uh, just uh, it was studied by Alain Anselme, who is sharing his knowledge on that. And uh, Emile Jobin will, will really make the realization of this uh, facsimile. And uh, it is a big project, uh, as you can understand, um, for French harpsichordists. So here you see the soundboard. Uh, it is an instrument with two keyboards, with two A's and a, and uh, you can see that the soundboard is painted like uh, in Netherlands. And um, what is uh, very nice is that uh, it is imitating a bit the metallic uh, roses made uh, in, in low countries. You have here uh, lady music playing the lute and uh, arabesque, and there is uh, a, a small snake, how do you call uh, a, a, a colimaçon? Uh, how do you call that uh, in your language? Uh, an escargot. Yeah, maybe you see uh, near the legs of, of uh, the lady. Caramujo, escargot, yeah. caramujo. Yeah, it is quite unique. And here you see also uh, the type of front of the keys. I was speaking for the spinet. It is the same uh, style of fronts. Now I come to a group of instruments by uh, today famous, uh, the famous Vincent Thibault in Toulouse. You see, it is uh, the second time I speak about Toulouse. Uh, fortunately, three instruments uh, are preserved. It is not a lot because, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a maker produced many more in his uh, life. <clears throat> this maker uh, is today a bit better known. Uh, I personally had the chance to purchase in 1977. It was an enormous experience for me. I went near Toulouse. Uh, in a small village, Lombez, and in a private hotel in that village, an hotel from the 17th century, there was <clears throat> the 
the instrument on the right. What you see here on the screen is the facsimile of the uh, original. You will see it later. Uh, it is uh, probably one of the last uh, harpsichord made by Vincent Thibault. He died that, uh, that year, uh, 1691. The first uh, preserved instrument is dated 1672. And uh, it is known for a long time because it belonged to Auguste Tolbeck, who was um, first a cellist, then a maker, an amateur violin maker, and then uh, I would say a scholar and collector of early instruments at the end of the 19th century. And Auguste Tolbeck, uh, among his important collection, today preserved in Brussels, uh, had purchased this unbelievable uh, and pretty Vincent Thibault. Uh, as you see, the case is uh, in walnut, but it is uh, all full of marqueteries. It is really gorgeous. And um, there is the arms of the proprietor, but nobody uh, could identify who was the proprietor. Anyhow, you see from far that uh, the three keyboards, they have two keyboards, they all have these uh, turned uh, legs, uh, they have a very special uh, style. And it is not only uh, the, the mobile, what is quite typical and quite, uh, I would say, uh, special by Vincent Thibault. What is very special is also the inside. The second instrument, as you see, is more simple. Uh, it has some marqueteries, but not so many. Uh, I would say it is a, a, a middle model. And the one, the la last one, uh, 91, uh, uh, is even simpler, simpler. Now I show you uh, the specimen in Brussels, and you see that the soundboard is painted uh, like in Netherlands. You see the keyboards, they have two small lions uh, sculptured on the side, and this motif is very current in the south of France. For example, if you go to to a church, very often you will see two columns and lions. And uh, I think it, it is very current uh, at the south uh, of Europe. Uh, the keys are very nice with three lobes, exactly like uh, for, for the Denis. And uh, if you look inside that instrument in Brussels, unfortunately, uh, the inner structure was quite destroyed and replaced in the 19th century. So it is not a good document to make a, specimen, uh, a copy or a facsimile. Here is the rose. And what is very strange is that the rose by Thibault is very similar to the rose used by Louis Denis. Uh, but look, it is more than a generation in between. So the question is, where did Thibault learn uh, his work? He was born uh, near Nantes. It means uh, in the west north of France. And uh, I found in the archives in Toulouse, I found uh, his master document when he became a master. And as you see above the document, he was received by the corporation, the, the guild of menuisier, carpenters. Not, there was not a special, a specific uh, a guild for makers because uh, they would have been too, too, too few of them in, in the city of Toulouse. The city was too small to have a, a specific uh, guild for makers. So uh, only to say that when he came to Toulouse, he was already 25. It means he probably learned somewhere else, maybe in Paris, why not? Uh, it is quite strange that he used 
quite the same rose. Or maybe he saw an instrument uh, by Louis Denis uh, in Toulouse, I do not know. Anyhow, this is uh, quite uh, interesting. Here I show you uh, the, the Thibault I could uh, purchase with Michel Robin, my colleague uh, from the museum. And you see on the right in which state was the instrument under the roof when the proprietor said, I want to buy that. I have no use of that case. And it was in such a bad condition, I think uh, we were lucky because that instrument was never, never transformed since uh, the end of the 17th century. It was a, a miraculous. Uh, you see that the keys uh, and the keyboard and the block blocks uh, at the side of the keyboards are much more simpler. There is only a small volute and uh, there is no decoration. You see that the painting disappeared quite totally because of the humidity and because of uh, it probably rained uh, under the roof of that uh, that hotel uh, in, in a small village in the small city. So it was a disaster. And what was terrible was the proprietor used the the harpsichord stand to to make a table. And he, he wanted not to sell the table. And we had to insist and to come back and to, to explain that it is so important to have the original legs of the, the original stand of the obstacle. Anyhow, uh, it was the beginning of a long procedure. And uh, we could uh, do a, a very deep study of that instrument, a technical drawing, analysis, many, many photos. And then uh, there was an, uh, a call for candidates to realize uh, the facsimile. And Emile Jobin uh, was uh, the man who, who get uh, that project. And here you can see uh, the facsimile built by uh, him for the museum in 1994. And what is very interesting is how light is the inside structure of that instrument. So thin bearing. And look at the soundboard. It is really uh, an influence of Italian instruments uh, with a, a, a bit a different bracing, but anyhow, very, very light. It means that instruments is sounding uh, in an unbelievable uh, immediate way. And what is also very strange is that there is in the rest plank where all the strings are settled, uh, there is a big hole in the bass. It means that the bass are very profound and very immediately uh, speaking. Uh, and this is a unique detail. Uh, Thibault used that and Emile Jobin decided to to give to the museum a, a real facsimile with this strange hole uh, inside the instruments in the bus, and to realize another one for the conservatory without the hole. And so that we can uh, compare uh, the effect of that, uh, I would say, invention from Thibault. So today uh, we are lucky to have acoustical uh, studies of both specimens, comparing them. And it, it was, as you can imagine, a great uh, uh, aventure. It, it was like uh, archaeology, the archaeology pratique, practical archaeology, you know, with comparisons. And so it, it was a, an important period for obstacle making. I come now to a, a third place. We saw Paris with Denis, we saw Toulouse with Thibault, and now uh, we will see Gilbert Desruisseau. Uh, he, he was a maker in Lyon, but it is very recent, I, I would say, only 30 years that we know that he, he, he was working in Lyon. Uh, for a long time, for example, when Madame de Chambure uh, 
was proprietor of that gorgeous uh, harpsichord, uh, we all believed it was a Parisian one, but it is not. It was built in Lyon. And uh, there is some, uh, I would say, common features with what we saw already, but also specific uh, other features. And for example, the fact that the, the instruments has a double curve is uh, quite uh, unique. You see that uh, the rows for the, the ruisseau is a, a, a paper rose and not a metallic rose. And unfortunately, here you see uh, that printed papers were used for the name board and all along the case. You see also that the fronts of the keyboards uh, are not with the three lobe like uh, by Thibault or Denis. And unfortunately, the, the inner structure was quite retouched by several makers uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So it is, it is not a I would say a good specimen uh, to ask a, a modern builder to, to make a replica. Now uh, I come to the Vaudry. Vaudry, uh, I, I wrote no uh, surname because it is probably, uh, it was probably built by two members of the dynasty Vaudry. Uh, this is a recent discovery, uh, and uh, it is dated 1681, preserved in London, as you see. Uh, what is quite uh, sumptuous is this chinoiserie in the style of Louis XIV uh, cabinets with red underground and black underground. Uh, you see also that the stand is quite the same that, that uh, what we saw. Uh, and uh, in the book written by Kotick, there is a very interesting diagram uh, for what he is calling the French chauve coupler. It means that you can pull out the lower manual and the coupler dog engage the jacks of the upper uh, manual keys. And it is a system we are no, no more used today because uh, usually we, we use 18th century uh, specimens uh, as copies. And this is quite interesting. Uh, I, I think, uh, for example, in, in the Paris Conservatoire, they are lucky enough to have a copy of the Thibault and they, le they, learn, they learn to, to use that system of coupling. So uh, you find it in, in all the 17th century French uh, instruments from Paris and from the regions. Among the, the, the iconographical sources, we should not forget to look at, for example, uh, engravings like uh, this one. It is an homage, a tombeau, about, uh, a tombeau littéraire for Madame. Who was Madame? She was the, the wife of Louis XIV's brother. And this young lady was a very good dancer. She was an articodist. She was a singer. Uh, I must say that Louis XIV was fond of her and maybe uh, they were in love both. But, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no story is reported. Anyhow, this lady uh, died very young. Uh, she, she was uh, 26 and uh, many, many composers uh, wrote a, a, a pavan or a tombeau for her. And here it is a tombeau littéraire, uh, an homage. And what is interesting is to see that there is a keyboard and a harpsichord with two keyboards. You see the small putty crying uh, near the keyboards. And uh, it is for us a good document. We, we see exactly the same uh, type of instruments that what we saw before in reality. Another good uh, design uh, of 
uh, both types of instruments. It means the, the spinet and the double keyboard uh, uh, harpsichord are shown on the page, uh, title page uh, of Chambonnier pièce de clavecin. And you see everything is from the same period. I think uh, when Chambonnier decided finally to print his music, because he said, uh, my music is circulating uh, per hand as a manuscript, and many people are transforming my music. I hate that. So I decided to publish it so that there is no more mistakes done uh, on my music. And it was the very beginning of uh, the Parisian uh, harpsichord music publishing with uh, Chambonnier. And uh, I, I like very much the, the, this engraving because once again, you see uh, the typical harpsichord from, from France and the small spinet. Another uh, quite strange document is uh, this drawing as you see preserved in the Metropolitan Museum, showing a concert. And uh, the, it is a, the sketch for an engraving for uh, a yearly almanac. You know, the, the king uh, printed each year an almanac, almanac royal, uh, with a special message. For example, when a, a son, uh, uh, came uh, on the world, or when he, he won a battle, or when he decided reform, uh, the almanac had a, a specific subject uh, to, to say, look what I did in the last year. And here, la coordination, it means the concordia between, uh, between different lands. It is because Louis XIV, as you know, was a terrible uh, uh, king. Uh, he wanted to annex many, many, uh, many places in the north and west of, uh, and east of France. And uh, this is exactly the contrary he, he was doing. He, he was always doing battles uh, around uh, France, but uh, he's telling the contrary. And uh, you see that in the middle, there is probably not only uh, the lands, but the continents. And you can see a person with feathers, uh, probably the, the personal notification of South America. And uh, the people are playing a, a very, very large bass, maybe a, a violone but also on the le left, a guitar. And you know that Louis XIV was a very good guitar player. And uh, in the middle, an obstacle from the time uh, with uh, two keyboards. Another interesting source is uh, an engraving in some examples of Pièce de Clavecin by d'Anglebert, all the printed, uh, uh, specimens do not have this engraving, but some have it. Uh, I discovered working on Lully and on Desmarais music that there was uh, special uh, issues of music for amateurs. Uh, you know, when, when you are a professional harpsichordist, you don't need such things. But when you are a noble and uh, you practice music, and you buy the, the last uh, uh, piece de clavecin by a certain composer, you will be very proud if, if you can show to your friends uh, a, a print of this new music with a supplement. And the supplement is an engraving. And uh, Pierre Mignard was in charge of an in, uh, the motive, the drawing for a print inserted in Les Pièces de Clavecin de Danglebert. Uh, there is one example, uh, exemplary in the Bibliothèque Nationale, another one uh, in the collection of Alan Robin, uh, a very famous collector of harpsichords living in Provins. And he has a, a specimen of, uh, of Danglebert with this engraving. And this engraving was so famous, it represents 
Madame Musique, uh, Musica, uh, that it was uh, copied, uh, you see, by Josef Werner uh, in Germany, and it is the same motive. What I like is that the harpsichord is quite precise with the stand, with the two keyboards, and once again, it is to show that there is really a quite classical uh, type of harpsichord in France during the 1660s, 70, you know. Apart from all these documents, there is also some portraits. And here, uh, it is an engraving, what we call uh, in, in Paris, uh, gravure de mode. Uh, it means what was important was not so much uh, the physiognomy of the portrait person. What was important was to be à la dernière mode, to wear the last way to be dressed and to, be, uh, to have a, uh, an air dressing. And, uh, fortunately, among these ladies at the harpsichord, many anonymous, only for the good, uh, for, for the, 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 the good um, dress, there is a portrait of Mademoiselle de Menetou, who was quite famous harpsichordist. And if you are interested in this lady, uh, a wonderful article just was just published uh, two years ago in La Revue Française de Musicologie on her and uh, on her pieces of. Uh, what is strange here is uh, how I would say un unaccurate is uh, the instrument. But this is a, a usual feature. All the graveurs de mode, and they were, uh, they had their studio, uh, Rue Saint Jacques. Rue Saint Jacques in Paris was a special uh, place where such uh, engravings were printed. They were cheap, they were a lot disseminated, and um, many of them uh, have musicians playing lute, and there is always a small poem uh, telling the effect of music on people. And Catherine Massip, our good colleague, uh, published uh, quite uh, 35 years ago, an important article about les gravures de mode et la musique. And uh, it shows that the musical instruments are not very well represented. They are not a very good source for organology, but interesting for the sociology of uh, practicing. You know, if you look at the lady on the left and the lady on the right, you see they have this strange hairdressing. We called uh, that hairdressing coiffure à la Fontange, because Madame de Fontange wore for the first time uh, this very high hairdressing. And it is typical from the years 1690 to 161700. So, uh, this drawing, anonymous, is for me wonderful because what you see, you see an harpsichord en vis-à-vis. -vis. It means with two keyboards uh, and the, the, the ladies are looking at each other. Uh, you probably know uh, that we don't preserve such an instrument for France, uh, but it probably existed. You see the music master, uh, or the singer, but he has a role and it is probably the music master. Now I come to a wonderful portrait. I love that portrait. Uh, it is by the famous portraitist François de Troyes, and it is Madame Elisabeth Jacquet de la Guerre. It is preserved uh, in a private collection in London. And you know, Madame Jacquet de la Guerre was not only uh, as a child a wonder, she, she was a wonderful harpsichordist. Uh, she played before Louis XIV. And later she became a, a wonderful composer, not only of harpsichord music, but also operas. Can you uh, figure that a lady is a composer for operas at that time? Well, it's very special. And she's here 
I would say she's gorgeous. She's pretty, she's rich, and she's showing that she's not only an interpret, but also a composer. You see, she's writing, but on the sheet of paper, we can't read nothing. It is a pity, but there is, a, it, it is a, a sheet of music. She's, uh, she has the knee uh, on a, a very, very uh, pretty harpsichord. The harpsichord is closed and uh, 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 on the lid of the harpsichord, you see argenterie, uh, a cafe or chocolate service, as you see, uh, showing that she is very rich. And uh, what is interesting is that harpsichord is described in the inventory of after her death. It is described with two keyboards uh, and it is said that to be Flemish, but I am convinced it was uh, Ravalet Flemish harpsichord. And the decoration uh, of the case of this harpsichord is very famous. It is after motifs from Duquesnois, a famous painter. So you see, uh, okay, the instrument is not very in the middle of the portrait, but it stays very interesting. And the lady is a prominent lady. At the contrary, <laughs> you see here, the poor Ni Nicolas Clérambeau, <laughs> not very pretty. And the engraving is also not very pretty. Uh, what I wanted to show is not the instrument because it seems to be a big fantasist. Uh, but the fact that he's composing also with a feather uh, in the hand, and we can read Cantat Orphe. Uh, the engraving is dated by chance. It means uh, we are now under the Regence, and the Regence is the period where. Uh, the type of uh, harpsichord stands uh, changed a lot. Uh, it's the beginning of curved stands, quite gently, not too marked, not, not yet totally rococo, only a bit curved. Here, it is to show you that many uh, composers uh, were happy to have their portrait composing. Once again, you see that Jean Ferry Rebel, who is uh, very played today eh, by many groups, Jean Ferry Rebel is at the harpsichord and is writing music, composing. And I love that drawing uh, by Watteau, but I must say this drawing is uh, destroyed totally. Uh, used and it is terrible. Uh, by chance, we have the engraving, not so, uh, not so pretty, but uh, the engraving is clearer. And we see a type of instrument very simple, like for a, a professional musician. And this uh, will be the type of instrument uh, like a Pierre Bello, you see, only with one keyboard, a slight curved, stand Regence style. And this specimen is preserved in Chartres at the Musée des Beaux-Arts. I think it, it, it suits very well uh, with that time. It suits uh, even more because we have two examples of an assembly with such uh, a harpsichord. Uh, made by Nicolas Lancret. They are very small paintings. Huh? And they show uh, the, the hotel in Rue de Richelieu. It means exactly in front of the actual uh, Bibliothèque du Roi, Bibliothèque Nationale. He was living in the same street. And he, he had um, a salon where once a week he received friends, as you see, the, the pretty ladies and gentlemen, and uh, that concerts were very famous because it was uh, very different uh, what mine uh, uh, could hear here there. It was not like in Versailles. It was cantate, sonate, Italian music. 
it was a totally different repertory. And uh, now it, it means the aristocracy was found of that. Here you see a young lady uh, singing with the score on a table. Uh, another one is waiting to sing and she has a, a fan. And uh, the harpsichord, it is a, a man who is playing the harpsichord and there is a bass gamba, a bassoon, uh, many violins and uh, contrabass, a uh, double bass. I, I like it because we see very well the musicians, but we see also how people were listening. It is not a concert hall. It is a house, it is house music. And uh, the men are standing, uh, you, you see, after the ladies. And what we see is this, this salon from Rue de Richelieu. And what is very nice is that we have a second painting, this time on the countryside, in Anguien, Anguien uh, was uh, La Maison de Campagne from Pierre Croza. I, I forget to say, uh, to say the, that Croza was a bankman, very rich. And he had a huge collection of Italian painting and engravings. And he, he supported a lot uh, Vato. Uh, he was very generous. And Vato could live in the house of Croza. It means uh, it is very important for us to, to figure uh, how music was shared and practiced at that time. We can see here even better uh, the small uh, lady singer. And I was lucky enough to find in the inventory after the death of Pierre Croza, the two harpsichords. The harpsichord in Anguien uh, with golden uh, stand and the harpsichord in Paris, a Flemish one painted black. So you see they are described in the inventories and typical uh, art historians already worked a lot in that inventory, but only for the paintings, only for the Italian paintings. And they ignored that there was the inventory of the music library of Pierre Croza. And we can see what they played there. Uh, there is many, many, many books of Italian music. Uh, okay, there was also Lully, there was uh, uh, bass, uh, uh, bass gamba pieces, etc. But it is very interesting to see how uh, some nobles influenced a new taste, uh, more open-minded. Okay, uh, it was to show you that harpsichord was practiced uh, in very different uh, contexts. Here it is uh, a very famous family, La Famille de Franqueville, and Jean-Francois de Troyes is showing that the, 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 the eldest uh, daughter is playing a harpsichord, and uh, you see the very strange stand uh, with a sphinx as a leg. Huh? It means that that man was very, very rich. But we, we can see very few of the technical aspects of the instrument. Now another lady, Marguerite de Sèvres, by the, the prominent portraitist Nicolas de Largillière. And uh, what is interesting is that the, the music book is readable and I hope somebody will work on that. It seems to be a tablature, but on the left, uh, at the end of the, the left page, uh, I can't read exactly what it is. Uh, I suppose it is a song, but there is before a tablature for instrument, maybe for harpsichord. Anyhow, please uh, help me to work on that. It's very fascinating. I, I, I must say, I, I never noticed that it is legible before to prepare the course for you. So it is the reason why I am telling that. I had no time uh, to, to dig a bit more. Here, uh, we are coming to a painter who was active under and, and Louis the 15, it means uh, later, Jean-Marc Natier. Jean-Marc Natier was the official portraitist of the court uh, during the middle of, of the, the 18th century. 
And I show you that portrait because uh, it is the family of Natier, his very young wife with the children. And in the inventory after the death of his wife, there is this harpsichord made by Dumont. And Dumont is a new name, uh, a Parisian name. Dumont was active uh, in the last uh, uh, years of the 17th century and later on. And here, the instrument is probably a Dumont Ravalé. Uh, it is probably transformed, but it is quite interesting to find that in this inventory, it is described with the name of the maker. Uh, Natier is very often a, uh, very a cure. Uh, for example, in the portrait of uh, the Gambist, daughter of the, uh, the 15, uh, the 14, uh, uh, there is an harpsichord, probably a blanchet, and uh, the same way the music is readable. During the same time, there was uh, in Lyon also makers uh, who did very interesting things. Uh, you remember that we already saw uh, this very interesting instrument for the 17th century. Uh, and now we see another maker, Pierre Donzelag, who learned in Paris, in Parisian workshops. Uh, we, we know his life quite well now because in Music Image Instrument, we published an important and important article uh, on his biography. And Don's Lag is important for us because look, that instrument is originally built in 1716 with five octaves. This is quite uh, unbelievable. It is probably the very first instrument in France with five octaves. And it's the uh, five minus uh, one key, but look, it, it, it is wonderful. And uh, the stand is also important for us because it shows uh, uh, a type of stand from the end of the, uh, the period of Louis XIV. We are not in Paris. So it means we don't have the last mode with curved uh, stands. It is still the still Louis XIV because in Provence, uh, very often uh, makers and uh, carpenters uh, are not uh, aware of the very last uh, changing uh, in, in, in the way to build. Uh, what I forget to say is that you see on, on the lead, there is Putti holding medallions and all these medallions are showing the portraits of the most famous composers played in Lyon at public concerts. Uh, Thomas Vernet just wrote a wonderful article uh, identifying all the, uh, the, the composers and in the middle at the very top, Rameau is painted. So it means the decoration was done uh, two generations uh, later uh, than the instrument. I think uh, if, if you admit, uh, I would like to have a, a small pause because it is now the night at, at home and I would like to drink and uh, I, I will let uh, Marcello uh, translate, uh, summarize what I said. Uh, I show you this drawing, I love it. It is a caricature preserved uh, in England of uh, as you see, uh, the, the, this, uh, I would say, uh, Le Père Castel, uh, he's not very serious, I think. He published uh, for the Academy des Sciences uh, a document about Le, le Clavecin, the couleur, mais nobody knows exactly how it worked. Nobody knows uh, how it could be built. And uh, Charles Germain de Saint-Aubin, uh, one of, of the friends of the, uh, the family Saint-Aubin, uh, who did many caricatures of many people and even two uh, of Rameau, uh, Saint-Aubin uh, gave us this wonderful uh, comic 
uh, image, you know, with uh, the tools, uh, the, the monochord and many things on the floor and a pedal, uh, blowing colors. Uh, nobody knows how it, it, it could work. Okay, so uh, we meet back in 10 minutes if you want, or 20 minutes. Okay, Florence, uh, thank you so much. É, bom, minha gente, eu fiz aqui várias anotações, vou tentar uh, transmitir para vocês. É, são muitas informações, como vocês é, perceberam, né? então, naturalmente, não dá para mencionar tudo, mas vamos lá. É, a aula de hoje vai do século XVII ao século XIX, na França, Inicialmente, ela menciona uh, alguns artigos, ou VI, artigos muito interessantes sobre uh, instrumentos, né? então, da Galpin Society, uh, na Inglaterra, e, posteriormente, 20 anos depois, foi, foi criada a Sociedade Americana de Instrumentos, American Music Instrument Society e que ambas as revistas uh, estão disponíveis online, de store ou no Reel. E, e Então, ela sugere que uh, sejam consultadas. É, depois, ela mostrou a publicação uh, que ela criou no Instituto de Recherche sur le Patrimoine Musical en France, que ela dirigiu, como eu contava ontem para vocês, é uma publicação maravilhosa, Musique, Image, Instrument desde 95 e há muitos artigos sobre cravos franceses do século XVII, de Luthiers, artigos do construtor Anselm, depois as escolas regionais, como de Lyon, artigos de Denis Erlan, com portraits, retratos de cravistas, cravos, etc. E aí ela colocou os sites, né? iremus.cnrs.fr e cnrs edition. Né, ponto .fr e, bom, se alguém depois tiver alguma dúvida, pode mandar um e-mail para ela, ou mesmo para mim, não, não, nem precisa incomodá-la, eu, eu mando os links. Bom, depois ela vai para a historiografia, né? ela começa a mostrar as primeiras imagens né, dos cravos franceses, desde o fim do século XVI, com o Célier, um manuscrito que mostra o clavicórdio e a espineta, esse manuscrito, ela chama a atenção que está na Gálica, né, que é o está é, disponível online no site da Biblioteca Nacional da França, BNF. Depois ela mostra a imagem conhecida de Mercedes, de 1636. Depois os cravos, desculpe, as espinetas preservadas, 1667, 72. É, então, nesse período inicial, é, são muito, é muito maior o número de espinetas do que propriamente cravos. Né? Ela chamou a atenção para os teclados em ébola e marfim. Depois ela mostrou uma imagem muito bonita, que é do castelo de Warron. É, tive a sorte de conhecer, me lembrei quando ela mostrou, que é a musa Calilpe tocando espineta, em 1650. E é interessante, ela chamou atenção para isso também, é, que na, 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 na pintura, na, na, na parede, pode-se ver os, os saltarelos do cravo. Isso é bem interessante. É, depois uma imagem de, aliás, é um óleo, desculpe, tipo G, é, com Santa Cecília Espineta, de 1651, é, e ela especula se não seria um regal, mas acha que é uma espineta, então ela chama atenção para as imagens de aspecto religioso. E depois de, de turnê, a pintura de um concerto em casa, 1632, 38 a pintura está no Louvre, e também ela chama atenção para uh, um aspecto que ela já mencionou ontem, que é da espineta uh, revestida uh, por couro vermelho né, e apoiada em cima de uma mesa. É, inicialmente, há poucos cravos, poucos documentos de cravos, né? é, mas ela mostra um cravo do Denis, de 1648, que está em, em Sudã, e... É um cravo que está que sofreu muitas mudanças, como ela falou, e ela lamenta que o curador né, do, do museu, onde ele está preservado, que tenha apoiado o um instrumento sobre blocos de madeira, né, sobre uma maneira de exposição, né, e, e não sobre os, os pés originais. 
né? E aí ela lembrou também que o Clavissant en France, né, a Associação Francesa de Cravos, tem um site, muitos aqui devem conhecer, está é, realizando uma cópia do instrumento, o estudo foi feito pelo Anselm, o construtor, e está sendo executado por, pelo Emílio Joban, construtor. Né? Cravos de dois teclados, é, com rosa metálica, e aí, agora não estou nem entendendo a minha anotação. Ah, imita imita a rosácea dos Países Baixos. Muito bem, depois ela ela chega no construtor importante de Toulouse, o Thibaut, com os três cravos preservados, de dois teclados, e dois originais e uma cópia. Ela mostra a cópia feita pelo Joban, se não me engano, e uma característica são os pés torneados. E aí ela chama atenção, ela foca bastante no instrumento que está em Bruxelas, que foi é, é da coleção do Torbeck, né, importante colecionador, é, esse cravo de 1672, com leões no teclado. Então, é, ela menciona ser um fato comum no sul da França. Depois tem um instrumento mais simples, 1681, é, e ela chama atenção para o fato de que a, a rosaça do Thibault é bem semelhante à do Denis. Então, onde o Thibault teria aprendido? Ela achou um documento que ela mostrou uh, de Toulouse, né, da, da associação, né, da, da, da corporação, né, e que o Thibault não aparece como construtor de cravo, sim como carpinteiro. Então, uh, especula-se que ele teria aprendido em Paris. É, depois ela mostra esse cravo Thibault de 1691, então ela mostra a foto dele num estado terrível de conservação, e depois, no mesmo slide à esquerda, ela mostra o instrumento restaurado. Ela conta que foi achado no telhado e que o proprietário usou os pés do cravo como mesa. Então, ela conta todo o processo de, de contato com o proprietário, dizendo a importância do instrumento. E ele atualmente está no Museu, no Museu da Música em Paris, no Cité de la Musique, e o Emílio Joban fez uma cópia em 94. E uma característica é que é um instrumento muito leve a semelhança dos cravos italianos. E, como resultado disso, é um som muito imediato, né? um som é, muito direto, como nos cravos italianos. Ela menciona né, é uma característica bem singular, que é um buraco no, na região grave, na região de baixo, e que o Elmi Joban fez duas tentativas, uma cópia com esse buraco e outra sem. Então, é, dá para se fazer uma experimentos né, dos resultados é, ouvindo as duas tentativas. Depois ela mostra o, o De Ruisseau, construtor de Lyon, descobriu-se recentemente que, que é um construtor de Lyon, é, é semelhante ao, ao modelo anterior que foi mostrado, mas tem a característica de ser um instrumento curvo, e a rosaça em papel, é um instrumento que foi bastante modificado. Ela chama bastante atenção no caso desses instrumentos modificados, que eles não seriam apropriados para para cópias, né? cópias atuais. Depois ela mostra uma, uma um tipo de gravura vura, que era bastante comum, que é a gravure de moda, quer dizer, aquelas gravuras que mostrava a moda, o que estava em moda e o que, que era o mais importante. Então ela mostra uma uma gravura de, da cravista é, Madame de Menetou é, e menciona também um artigo da Catherine Massip, publicado, se eu não me engano, no Musique Image Instrument, agora não tenho certeza, e ela chama atenção para o fato dessas gravuras de moda não serem propriamente documentos muito acurados para, para, para se observar os instrumentos, etc. É mais para sentir o espírito da época. É, depois ela mostra uma outra gravura interessante, que é um cravo, é, que é como se fosse uma peça só, com dois teclados vis-à-vis, -vis, quer dizer, de um de frente para o outro. É uma cena de 1695. Depois ela mostra um lindo retrato da Isabelle Jacquet de Laguerre, de 1695, do pintor Troyes, está em Londres. E ela, ela é encantada, como a gente viu, por esse portrait, realmente é lindo. E chama atenção né, para Elisabeth Jaquet de Laguerre estar tá ao cravo, mas o cravo está fechado, sobre o cravo está uma prataria, o que indica como ela era rica. Ela está segurando uma partitura, então mostra 
ela quis se retratar como compositora, mas ela na juventude era uma cravista excepcional, né? é, de Luiz XIV. Em seguida, é, vem uma gravura do Claire Rambord, ela diz que, que feio, muito feio, 1710. Depois o Rebelle compondo, e aí ela mostra à esquerda um croquis de Vator, e depois a gravura, que está bem mais é, 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 clara de se ver, e logo em seguida o um instrumento Belô, que está no Museu de Chartres, que seria um instrumento adequado, né? enfim, da mesma época e, e para esse tipo de, de situação. Né? Depois do pintor Lancré, ela mostra duas cenas, uma assembleia com cravo, é uma pintura de 1720, 24, é um salão e ela chama atenção para o fato de ser um ambiente bastante diferente de Versailles, né? um ambiente da aristocracia e que tocava um repertório diferente. Então, é, e no slide seguinte, ela mostra do mesmo proprietário, que era Rosa, se não me engano, já numa casa de campo, mas o repertório que se fazia nesse tipo de ambiente. Depois do pintor Troyes, uma família, Franqueville, outra cena doméstica. Depois, uma outra pintura de L'Argilière, onde pode se ler a partitura, e ela, ela, isso só chamou a atenção dela ao preparar essa aula, né? uma, uma pintura de 1729. Então, quem sabe, pode -se, poderá se reconstituir e tocar. Depois ela mostrou uma linda pintura do Nathier, que era um pintor agora já de Luís XV, com a mulher dele, Madame Nathier, tocando no Cravo Dumont, de 1762. Depois ela mostra um lindo cravo do Dom Zelag, de Lyon, e é, um dos primeiros com cinco oitavas, um cravo todo dourado, e termina com uma caricatura de 1755, com uma coisa bastante estranha, não se sabe muito bem como ela diz que, é, um cravo com, com cores e objetos no chão e monocórdios, etc. Então, basicamente foi isso que ela falou. Ok, Florence? Est-ce que tu es prête pour continuer? Voilà. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui, très bien. Vous m'entendez bien Alors, je vais à nouveau partager l'écran. Est-ce que vous me voyez Vous voyez bien l'écran Oui, on voit très bien. OK. So now, we will uh, look at the... I would say the middle of the, the 18th century in Paris. And what you see on the screen is an instrument preserved today in Versailles. It was not already in Versailles uh, in, in the 18th century, but it, it is exactly the type of instruments that the daughters of Louis XV, the 14th, uh, sorry, Louis XIV, Louis XV, bought for uh, the four daughters. Uh, it was built by a member of the dynasty Blanchet. Blanchet was a very famous dynasty. Uh, the first one was Nicolas Blanchet. Uh, he was working between uh, 1700 and 1731. And he was already in charge with the court. Then uh, François Etienne Premier. Uh, his son worked with him and also for the court. And there is many documents, bills, you know, and invoices preserved in the, the Archive National, uh, giving us many details uh, how um, the instruments were preserved and uh, cared and tuned and transported from a, 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 a demeure royal to another demeure royal. It means from uh, Versailles to Fontainebleau to Compiègne, etc. Uh, each time uh, the daughters wanted to go on the countryside. These instruments, as you see, have two keyboards. Uh, they, they have a very uh, 
soon five octaves. They have two eighths and one four foot. And uh, th th I think it is probably the most disseminated model or uh, type of instruments over, over the world uh, since the 20th century. Maybe I am wrong, but uh, in many, many conservatories, uh, Blanchet models are quite uh, uh, usual. Uh, you, you can see that uh, the proportions are not so long like an Italian one, uh, a bit longer than a Flemish, and the, the structure inside is quite strong, you know, quite uh, heavy if you compare it with a Thibault, for example. And it means that the instrument, uh, built very often in uh, uh, Linden, how do you say Linden in, in, in English? Uh, Tiel. Uh, they were more heavy than, than I, the 70 I, I, I have to check, just a second. Yeah, okay. Anyhow, uh, it is a white uh, wood and very current uh, in, in France. So, here, uh, this diagram from, from Franco Bird is giving quite a, a, a general idea how it looked like uh, in France in the 18th century. Uh, you all know these engravings uh, reproduced in uh, the Encyclopédie. Uh, this is in the supplement of the Encyclopédie. It means much more later than the very first edition. The first edition is uh, 1751 and uh, you, you see this uh, in instrument with two keyboards with cabriole, cabriolet stand. Uh, what is very strange is that the, the in structure of the instrument is for uh, scholars and makers not at all realistic. Uh, probably uh, the man who went uh, in the workshops uh, could not see the Aina structure. It was a secret, I suppose, because nobody knows such a, a bearing inside an instrument from that time. So it is quite unrealistic. Here, uh, I took this uh, comparison between 17th and 18th century uh, features uh, in Kotik, and it is quite interesting if you can have the book uh, at home or in the library. Uh, you can see that uh, the sides are more heavy in 18th century. Uh, the, the, wo the world I was looking for is poplar uh, for, for the, the, the wood of the case. Uh, the building is more heavy. Uh, the sound bearing also. The rose is no more in parchment uh, it is in metal, etc. The decoration is not so full of pretty, uh, pretty birds and flowers. And you see the, the compass changed a lot, uh, coming progressively to the five octave. Uh, what, what is also uh, quite interesting is that uh, gold and uh, paintings are very often present when the people ordering is rich, and it means it plays a, a huge role uh, for the society, for the sociability, and uh, uh, this is one subject in itself, how these instruments were uh, decorated. We will now see some composers. Here it is a painting by uh, Natier, but uh, not a painting, a pastel. And uh, Pancras Royer uh, is known from Harpsichordist because we, we play some of his music. And you see he's composing uh, from his opera Zaid here, uh, an aria quite famous. It is readable. And uh, what is very nice is that the instruments is uh, like for the, the, the former composers, very near to him. Uh, because he will try what he is composing on the keyboard. He had three daughters, Pancras Royer, and the three daughters 
uh, were portrayed by Carugis uh, Carmontel. Uh, you see that they play many different things, and they also play an extract of Zaid. It means it was really the tube uh, by, by, by Pancras. Uh, among the composers, there is also the, the wives of composers. And for example, Anne-Jeanne de Mondeauville uh, was portrayed by uh, the famous Quentin de Latour. And uh, if you zoom on the, on, on, on the music, you see piece de clavecin de Madame de Mondeauville. I, I had no time uh, when I prepared uh, the work for you to check in the realm uh, in the rhythm, if there is uh, any manuscript of her uh, preserved, uh, because Mondonville is, is a man is much more uh, well known as a violinist and uh, violin composer. But you see, she, she's posing and showing that she can also compose. Now it is uh, another famous lady. She buried Favard, uh, the, the man who organized so many opera comiques in Paris in the middle of the 18th century. She was a singer, dancer. Uh, she played comedy. And the music on, on the, the music stand is not readable. It's readable, but not identified. So she's showing that she can play uh, with cross hands and uh, quite interesting. Now I come to another uh, workshop. It is Jean-Henri Emsch. Emsch was an uh, immigrated from Germany and he settled in Paris. Uh, he did his master uh, uh, proof uh, quite late. And here you have, uh, I would say the common uh, harpsichord, exactly like the Blanchet we saw before without any a special decoration, but you see that the soundboard is very fine made, uh, always with this symbol of of a bird on a, a dead uh, uh, a, a dead tree. It means that um, a dead wood will become uh, once again vivid uh, through the music instrument, and it uh, it is a very nice symbol. By Carmontel, we also have this uh, quite well-known portrait in profile. Why? Because Carmontel was uh, an amateur portraitist. He was not a professional. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, in charge of the spectacles at home from a, a noble family. And uh, he sketched everybody coming uh, from the, the high society. Uh, and it is easier when you are not a, a professional painter to, to have a drawing from the profile. Uh, Rameau is here quite um, uh, at the end of his life. He's not using exactly uh, the harpsichord. You see the harpsichord is closed with uh, many leaves of of papers. We are not sure uh, there are scores and he's writing we are not sure he's writing music, he's maybe writing theory. And on the floor, we can read Code de Musique and the Code de Musique was just published in 1760. And uh, it is uh, probably the date also of the drawing, but it is a quite charming uh, portrait of him. From the same drawer, Carmontel, uh, we have uh, aristocrat, like on the right, huh, Madame de Maupassant, who, 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 she was an amateur musician, but in the, and, and she has a wonderful instrument, as you see, uh, uh, a fond blanc, huh? it means that it was painted white, uh, but all the, 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 the garlands and the sculptures are clear blau, what is quite unique. Uh, I don't think people today are by choosing this type of decor. But it was very suitable if your salon uh, had a wooden lambri painted in white and you could coordinate uh, the decoration of the harpsichord and uh, of, the, of, of the salon. On the left, 
I choose it because uh, it is uh, it represents Mademoiselle Pitouin and her father at the Gamba. Mademoiselle Pitouin is known because uh, you remember that Dufli uh, uh, did a, a portrait of her in music, uh, a musical portrait. And what is very nice is that on the score, we can read Mede, and Mede was a famous piece also with a lot of bass in the Livre de Clavecin de Dufli. Uh, you probably played uh, that piece also. So you see, if you take a look, you, you can uh, find many things in, in portraits and, and uh, uh, paintings and drawings. Now I come to uh, the famous Mozart Enfant uh, with the father. Uh, they were in Paris uh, in 1763. Uh, they met Carmontel uh, when the, the small boy as a, a sort of genius played uh, in all the, at the court uh, be, uh, before the daughters of Louis XV, but also in Paris uh, by the Prince de Conti. And <coughs> The question uh, uh, is which instrument played uh, Mozart? Maybe a hench. Uh, the, the shape of the stand is quite uh, near. But uh, if we look at the, the other version of Carmontel, it is uh, made three years later after uh, <coughs> the travel of, of Mozart, his father and daughter uh, in, in England. Uh, and when they came later, uh, once again, he was bigger, as you can see. Uh, lo look, if you compare both, it is quite uh, strange. Here, the legs are very short, uh, he's quite high, and later on, uh, the legs are longer. And I, I love this uh, too, uh, I would say, uh, uh, it's like a small film. And um, maybe it could be also Blanchet. We, we can't be certain between Blanchet and Emsch. Anyhow, uh, this, uh, the, the, the small boy played also when he was back in 1766 uh, in, le, in the very big apartment of Le Prince de Conti. And uh, many people wonder about the instruments represented here. And they say, oh, the painter is not a curate, etc. But I tried to work on uh, the Prince de Conti. There is now a PhD by Thomas Vernet, but before that, I found uh, in the, the catalog of auction of the collections of the Prince de Conti, where there is all the paintings he processed, there is the music, there is the instruments. And among the instruments, what we found, a schmal and a spät uh, tangenten flügel. It means that the Prince de Conti was very open-minded and played at home uh, German uh, aesthetic instruments. Uh, it means not only Parisian uh, instruments. Uh, and this is, is quite interesting. It means the influence were uh, present and I wonder if it was not something like that, like a Hammerflügel, or maybe from Spät, uh, a Tangentenflügel. And you see, the, the case is, is, is not very deep, but there is some uh, common features, uh, like, for example, the use of the woods and uh, the very simple stand, only uh, slightly curved. So this makes us think about uh, the different aesthetic at the same time in Paris. Uh, in the same way, this quite a um, strange portrait of one of the of the daughters of Louis XV, Madame uh, Madame Victoire. Uh, the portrait is quite late, and such an instrument is for me for me Viennese. And maybe when the mother, Marie Lenzitska, came uh, to France, um, she preserved a relationship with uh, her original country. And uh, you see this uh, 
the cut of, of, of the sides of the instrument is not French. So uh, it stays a question for me. It, for me, it's not a French instrument. A part of, uh, from Paris, uh, Lyon is still uh, producing very interesting instruments. And here you have uh, Joseph Colles, who was a, a quite famous maker. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, specimen, uh, two keyboards, five octaves. And what is uh, quite strange, if you look at the soundboard, you see no rows. There is a bunch of flowers, but no opened rows. And it sounds wonderful. So this is uh, something special. And uh, I will still wait that acoustician will endly, uh, finally do research on uh, the presence or the absence of a rose on a soundboard. Now I would like to come to uh, the question of ravalement. It means uh, if you listen to ravalement, it means uh, that uh, in aval, it means in the bass, we will um, change something. Huh? This is, is, is the signification of ravaler. And uh, if we compare a Flemish structure and a, uh, a Parisian uh, Hanger uh, bracing by Pascal Tasquin, uh, we already see that they are quite different and uh, more important, more uh, uh, dimensions are, are bigger. And what is very special is that Tasquin is always polishing his uh, Hanger bracing. And it is a sort of signature. Uh, it is not a uh, crude of work, uh, it is polished. And uh, ravalement uh, will be the procedure to, to bring an instrument probably already enlarged at the beginning of the 18th century with some notes, but uh, to, to the point that it will have five octaves. And very often uh, it, it was not possible without cutting down uh, the case, enlarging the case at the ribs, enlarging the soundboard, uh, modifying and uh, probably uh, moving out or uh, transforming uh, the brace inside. So it was a huge work. Why uh, did they did that? Because they loved the sound of old harpsichords and Flemish harpsichords, uh, exactly like we love uh, a Stradivari uh, renaked uh, with a new neck and uh, uh, changing the, 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 the bass bar, etc. It is the same spirit, the same procedure to modernize, to have more sound and to have more keys uh, to play the, the modern repertory. So uh, I, I show you this for the second time so that you see the increasing of, of uh, of the keyboards uh, at the, during the second uh, half of the century. And it is very evident that for the written music, you need a larger keyboard. Sometimes both keyboards were changed and completely uh, replaced. And I will show you some examples. I show you uh, the Johannes Ruckus, 1617 uh, from Paris, from the Musée de la Musique. And you see uh, that the aspect outside shows an original painting on the lid, inside the lid, uh, like the painters uh, in low countries. But uh, along the case of the instrument, we will see that it is totally repainted. And inside the instrument, we see that there is Dave, uh, uh, how do you say, the uh, queue d'arrondes, the, the dovetails uh, um, to enlarge the, the bracings. It is unbelievable how much they worked to transform and to, to have a, a larger instrument. Uh, normally on the soundboard, you can see the piece of wood all along the side 
showing that it is like uh, when a child uh, is getting uh, bigger and uh, you need to have a, a piece of material uh, to enlarge uh, the dress, for example. It is the same, it is visible. And then you see that the painters had to paint more uh, flowers uh, to uh, not, not to show the, this enlargement, but it is visible. And here, uh, the case is totally repainted. Uh, the stand is probably Regence, early Regence, and not from the, the end of the century. Uh, what is also uh, interesting is on this Johannes Couchet, preserved in Paris, uh, you can see that the stand is totally Louis XIV and not uh, Couchet. Couchet is middle of 17th century. And here you have a Louis XIV uh, type of stand. You see that the, the cover of the, the instrument is painted uh, after motifs by Bérin. Bérin uh, was a decorator under Louis XIV. And uh, if you look at the, the soundboard, it is the same. The soundboard is in large. What is interesting on the right of the picture is that uh, the original decoration of the case is still there with false marble. Uh, you see, this is the original uh, painting uh, made in Anverken uh, in the workshop of Couchet. Uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, on that instrument, from Johannes Rukus. I don't have a picture. I could not find my, my picture. Uh, uh, other side, there is the false uh, metallic motif uh, uh, that I showed yesterday. It is, it, it is like a, a monument with several levels uh, and several periods visible. And if, if you don't see it because it is against a wall, you don't care and you, you let the the old original painting. Now I come to uh, this Andreas Rukers, quite famous, uh, rebuilt the first time at the beginning of the century. Why do I say that? Because we see that uh, the motifs uh, of, the, uh, of the cover and uh, of the, uh, around the case, are also from the period of Bérin. It means uh, very uh, beginning of 18th century. But there is a third uh, work done by Pascal Tasquin in 1780. And we can see very clearly at the drawing of uh, the, the curved uh, eclipse, you know, that there is one motif more because there is a piece of wood so the motif is repeated and it is not the same hand. It is quite visible uh, how it was enlarged and the case was really enlarged. And uh, I love also this uh, detail because you see that the stand, the stand is Louis the 16. Uh, it is no more Louis the, the 15, but the 16 at the time of Pascal Tasquin. And the painter had no time to finish the motifs on the stand, you see, it is not finished. There is only the, the under uh, uh, colors, the, the clear blue, and he had no time. Probably uh, the person who ordered it said, it is enough time, now I want my instruments, uh, please deliver it. Uh, so uh, you see how complicated are uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, the different, stages of uh, rebuilding an instrument. Uh, you see also under the stand, under the, the, the case, uh, very strange, small, uh, uh, in, in France we say tétine, uh, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, and these are the genouillères. They are moved by the knees, by the musician, and it do not need to to, uh, uh, he can left, he can leave his hands on the keyboards. And it is a, a mechanic system to register uh, without the help of the hands. So you can play uh, and 
during the same time, you uh, move the registers with these knee levels, genouillère. Huh? And uh, it is present on the Rucker Stasquin, uh, on, uh, on this instrument also, you see, they are very visible because uh, there is red leather on them. And here we have uh, François Blanchet II, uh, who reused a Johannes Couchet soundboard. And then the instrument was uh, in the shape of uh, uh, Louis XV style, but it was ravalé en grand by Pascal Tasquin in 1778. And um, when it was sold in auction uh, at the end of the 80s, and uh, Kenneth Gilbert bought it for his, uh, himself, uh, the night before the auction, I found in the Archive Nationale, in the inventory of the, the goods that belong to uh, the nobles, uh, les émigrés, emigrated people, uh, because the revolution was coming. I found in the list of objects uh, sequestered for, for, the, for the government uh, that in the Hotel Kinski, this lady was a Viennese lady. Uh, she had a, a, um, a componist and harpsichordist in her house. Uh, and she had a clavecin peint en gris fait à Paris par Pascal Tasquin. And it is this one. On the soundboard, there is still today an inscription, Palfi Kinski. And because I identified this mark, uh, put it, it in connection with this inventory, uh, I was so sorry that this instrument could not come to the Conservatoire de Paris. Why? Because the Kinski instruments were transported by the Convention Nationale in the conservatory pour, to, to create the famous cabinet des instruments qui doivent servir pour la nation. But it, it was sold again in 1806 when Cherubini wanted to have a, a small room as an office. And he said, okay, leave all that instruments uh, to an auction and we will repair the roof of the conservatoire. It's a terrible story, uh, but uh, Kenneth Gilbert was lucky. He bought it, he played it, he recorded it. Okay, and uh, you know, uh, the maker, I am very, uh, I give you an unpublished hypothesis. I think in this painting of uh, it, it is a pastel uh, showing Armand Louis Couperin with his wife. His wife is strangely showing another portrait. And my hypothesis is that uh, at, in that year, it is in 1766, died uh, Blanchet, François Etienne de Blanchet, the maker of that obstacle. And I think it is his portrait. Otherwise, uh, there is no reason that she's showing that man and it is not the physiognomy of his husband. Okay, I come uh, with now the Jean-Claude Goujon. Why? Because Jean-Claude Goujon uh, was a maker active in Paris in the middle of the century. He built that instrument, but he signed on the name board, Hans Rueckers me Feschit Antwerpiae, uh, 1589. Uh, cool, strange. Huh? And till uh, Bedard came to work in the workshop in Paris, everybody thought, okay, it is a Flemish harpsichord, Ravalli. But when Bedard worked on it, he found inside the instrument the signature with pencil from Jean-Claude Goujon. It means this instrument is a forgery of Hans Rickers. And if you look at the rose and at the motive of soundboard, specialists uh, are still immediately aware that it is not an original rose from Hans Rickers. 
and that the motives are not from the 17th century, but from the 18th century. So it is a fake, it is a forgery. It means that in 18th century Paris, makers to make business and to have more money built false ruckus instruments. And this is one of them. It, it is no more a ravalement, it is no more uh, uh, like did Blanchet uh, using, for example, a very old soundboard because it sounds better than a modern one. It was to build entirely an instrument uh, in the so-called style of Flemish, but we see it is not accurately uh, copied. And if you look at the soundboard, you don't see also this piece of wood to enlarge the soundboard. It is equal. So it is one in this more. Okay, I will finish my my course today uh, coming uh, later, coming to the 19th century. And, uh, you know, I think we believed uh, for a long time that after the revolution, uh, harpsichords were forgotten, put away, no more played, uh, never cared, etc. cetera. Um, the more we work, the more we read uh, in the newspapers, for example, reviews uh, on private concerts, uh, the more we see that some musicians were still practicing. And we have a more, uh, I would say, uh, not such a, a, a sharp or crude uh, idea what, what was going on. It is more complicated. Uh, the first thing is that, for example, some musicians, some pianists were interested in the music. And for example, Ami de Mero, <coughs> who was working in, uh, in Rouen, uh, published a series of uh, music books. You see, Champion de Chabonnière, Couperin, Kramer, Frescobaldi, Haydn, etc., Mozart, Purcell. Uh, it means that the music was suddenly available for pianists. This was the first respect. Uh, okay, we have to be careful. They were uh, uh, pretend in, in a way that pianists uh, were not uh, forgotten uh, with the keys, with uh, the um, ornaments, uh, etc. But okay, it was already uh, a first step. Then you have Amé de Miro, uh, and for the first time, he's interested also in historical instruments and he's reproducing some items uh, preserved in the very new Musée Instrumental uh, opened in 1861. Uh, so this had also an important uh, effect on musicians. And then you have also Farenc, Aristide Farenc and his wife, and they published a lot of music uh, in a more accurate way, uh, more respectful for the uh, ornaments. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, we should look at that also exactly like we, like we look at Saint-Saëns uh, Rameau edition. Uh, it means uh, there was really an interest during that year. A big step was uh, the international exhibition of 1889, because in, during that uh, international exhibition in Paris, uh, there was concerts organized on original instruments. And here I could found a very small vignette, it is, uh, a small illustration in the general journal called L'Illustration. L'Illustration was a bit like Paris Match today. It was a, a, a weekly uh, journal uh, with news of uh, inventions, uh, arts, uh, literature, uh, events uh, of all sorts, and it was illustrated. This was very new for a newspaper. And what uh, you see here is a concert. And I look uh, and I, I decided 
uh, 20 years ago, it can only be Louis Diemer playing the ruckus Tascan that belonged before to Madame de Chambure. And I found a, a review of that concert in, in l'illustration. So uh, you, you see, uh, working more and more, we see uh, what was done. And uh, it means that Diemer, who, who was a professor for piano in the conservatoire, but who was also uh, one of the uh, regular harpsichordists at the end of the century, played uh, in a, with a selected public, okay, but he played that workers. At the same time, there were um, painters, I would say, uh, historicizant painters. It means painters who wanted to, to produce paintings of the charming 18th century. Uh, you know, there was a love for, for the past. Uh, at the beginning of the century, it was a Gothic period, but later it was the 17th and 18th century. And the brothers Goncourt, les Goncourt, they wrote uh, a lot of literature on uh, La Camargo, on uh, uh, the, the famous lovers of Louis uh, the 15th and painters were inspired by such motifs. Look, this is uh, quite late, huh? it is 1867. And my hypothesis, the harpsichord looks like the Goujon. It's quite the Goujon. Okay, and now please don't laugh, but I think it is once again, an instrument like the Goujon, but with a lyre like Pleyel could have built. And this is a, a terrible painting. Uh, Charles Bur Burneri was a, an Italian painter. Huh? He, he changed his name. Uh, and he painted an amount of these terrible paintings uh, with cardinals. Uh, but it means that, uh, old instruments were in circulation and that uh, in the studio law of painters also. It was a time, 1889, uh, uh, when Erard uh, began to uh, build a, a, sort, a sort of replica of, his, of the uh, mechanical harpsichord build, built by Sébastien Erard in 1779. It is strange, it is quite the same shape, but look, the structure had nothing to do with uh, an original harpsichord from the 18th century. It is a structure of a modern piano. And we will see that all the uh, so-called uh, revival harpsichords are really built in another aesthetic than all what we saw uh, from the beginning of the course. Look, this is now Pleyel and Wolf. Uh, it, it is three years later. <clears throat> and uh, we can imagine that the sound can't be the same, can't be the same. It is so heavy. And you have pedals. Uh, and French instruments had no pedals. And look, now, uh, some years later, it's always increasing in, in solidity and it, it is quite uh, impressive. And you see then Gavo uh, much more later, uh, you see the mechanism, it, it, it is uh, even more and more complicated to register. And I come to the Grand Model de Concert Pleyel. Uh, you imagine that this was the next plus ultra uh, for Panda Landowska. She was an eminent player, an eminent uh, inspirer for the firm Pleyel. And I think uh, we should not condemn uh, this aesthetic. I think it is a moment in the history uh, uh, that we are digging along uh, in another way, okay, with new discoveries. But uh, I remember when I was very young, uh, I had problems to listen to Wanda Landowska, but I think the more we learned, the more we, we see how important she was. And it will be my conclusion. 
I think I... Okay, Florence, uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I'll try to, uh, to tell uh, very shortly what you, what you spoke. Uh, and uh, after uh, we can come to the, the questions and comments, ok? Então, gente, vou rapidamente resumir o que ela falou é, e depois vamos aos comentários e às perguntas. É, antes de mais nada, queria lembrar a, a todos e todas que estão nos assistindo da lista de presença, né? aqueles que desejarem e precisarem de um certificado de presença no curso, é, então, é, o link está aí no chat, então, por favor, é, mandem, é, preencham lá os formulários, tá? para que a gente tenha o um registro e depois possa emitir os certificados, tá? lembrem-se disso. Muito bem, antes eu queria pedir desculpas a vocês, porque na, depois, depois do intervalo, quer dizer, no intervalo, né, teve uma página aqui que me escapou, bem que na minha memória alguma coisa me dizia que <risos> tinha faltado alguma coisa, foram muitas páginas, então, aqui, rapidamente, eu vou dizer, ela, ela é, mostrou um, um cravo muito lindo do Vaudry, todo em Chinoiserie, é, que está no Victoria and Albert, em Londres. É, depois, ela mostrou, é, isso é interessante, a questão das publicações com as imagens de cravos. Né? Então, ela mostrou do Chambonier, que, onde a gente vê na folha de rosto uma espineta e um cravo de dois teclados, na pièce de clavecin. É, depois, no Almanac Real, o croquis... É, tá, quer dizer, há, há uma versão no Almanac Real de 1679 e o croquis, que está no Metropolitan, Nova York, é, com guitarra, violone e um cravo de dois teclados. E ela lembrou que o Luiz XIV tocava guitarra. Depois, o Dan Glebert, Uh, isso é interessante, porque ela chamou a atenção que os amadores, para os músicos não, os músicos só queriam a partitura e acabou, mas os amadores faziam questão de outras coisas. Então, tinha um suplemento na partitura, uma gravura inserida. E, então, é como se fosse um bônus na, na publicação. Agora vamos à segunda parte. Né? Então, ela mostrou o Blanchet de Versailles, de 1746, e é um instrumento que eu conheço bem, porque o meu cravo mestre é cópia desse instrumento. Depois, ela mostrou uma, uma, uma tabela do, do, do Hubbard comparando os instrumentos e, e, e as características pesadas né, dos instrumentos, mais pesados dos instrumentos franceses. É, e, e uma tabela bem interessante do Cote, que ela mencionou ontem, né, com as características dos instrumentos franceses do século XVII e século XVIII. Depois vieram as imagens dos compositores, né, o Royer, uh, retratado por Nathier, depois o Carmontel, que aliás era um pintor amador, como ela mencionou, ela mostrou várias imagens do Carmontel, com as três filhas de uh, Royer, depois o Latour com a Madame de Mondoville, com peças dela, obras dela, né? autora, compositora. Depois o Drouet com a Madame Favard, cantora. A Salle Favard em Paris, como sabem, é da, uma sala importante. Depois ela mostra o Cravo Hemsch. O Hemsch era um imigrante alemão, atuando em Paris. Então, um Cravo também bem conhecido, de 1761. É... E aí ela chamou atenção na rosácea para a questão, quer dizer, que é, a madeira morta, né, que precisou ser morta para construir a, o instrumento, ela aparece viva novamente no tampo com os desenhos. Depois tem uma, uma, um pastel, se não me engano, do famoso, do Ramot, por Carmontel, e no chão vê-se uh, uh, o Code de Musique, obra de Ramot, de 1760, o que ajuda na datação da do retrato. Depois de Carmontel, várias obras, Madame de Maupassant, Madame Pitouin, é, que inspirou a peça de Dufy, e na, no retrato se vê a partitura da Medé, obra de Dufy, que muitos aqui conhecem. Depois, interessante, é, os dois, do, dois, dois retratos de Mozart, em criança, em 1763, depois, em 1766, ela até faz uma analogia como se fosse um filme, né? a gente vê Mozart pequeno, depois um pouquinho mais crescido, e ela especula quais teriam sido os instrumentos, né? talvez o Hemsch, talvez o Blanchet, 
ambos os instrumentos que ela mostrou. É, depois tem uma, uma cena interessante no, 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 no Prince de Conti, na casa do Prince de Conti, de 1766, uma obra do Olivier. Então, especula-se se não seria um tangente, um flugue, é um instrumento bem alongado, bem, bem, bem curioso, e ela mostrou a imagem do Rama Fieger, né, do Forte Piano Zibaman, que poderia ser também, essa seria uma possibilidade do instrumento ali retratado. Uh, depois, a filha de Luiz XV, Madame Vitoire, uh, talvez com um instrumento vienense, já não, pela aparência já não seria um instrumento francês. Depois, um instrumento bastante conhecido, um colés, que está em Lyon, de 1768, Desculpe, construído em Lyon, mas que está em Paris, e sem rosácea. Então, essa é uma questão interessante. E Então, quer dizer, mais pesquisas deveriam ser feitas para comprovar ou não a importância acústica de haver uma rosácea ou não no tampo harmônico. Depois, ela traz uma questão importante para nós, que é a questão do Ravalumã, é, que é a questão do, do, do aumento da extensão, né? Então, ela mostrou novamente aquela tabela e, e chama a atenção, quer dizer, a, a, um, um dos objetivos era o aumento da extensão para cinco oitavas. Né? E, claro, que um aumento, uma, uma, uma mudança dessas é uma mudança drástica nos instrumentos e que era, essa mudança era impossível de ser feita sem a, que, se, que fosse mexido o tampo harmônico e o, e o corpo do instrumento. Era um grande trabalho e ela faz também uma analogia interessante com os violinos, os Stradivarius, né? que os, os Stradivarius foram modificados e continuaram a ser tocados. E o mesmo acontecia com os instrumentos flamengos, que eram muito admirados, muito gostavam muito do, do som desses instrumentos, mas para tocar um repertório mais moderno, que havia essa necessidade da alteração da extensão. Aí ela mostra um quadro de extensão bem interessante que está no, no Cote, e depois alguns casos de, de Ravalimã, de um Rukas, de 1612, que foi alterado em 1720. Então, sempre se observa as emendas, ela chama a atenção disso, as emendas, quer dizer, novos pedaços de madeira que são inseridos, e, claro, as flores de decoração para esconder essas emendas. Depois, um instrumento couché, e aí observa-se os pés diferentes, né? uma decoração diferente do corpo do instrumento, então, um instrumento de 1652, que foi alterado em 1701. E ela, ela mostra, bem interessante, o lado o, 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 do, do instrumento, o lado esquerdo, que ainda é pintura é, original, que simula o mármore, né? ainda, ainda foi mantido. Então, são esses detalhes que ela vai chamando a atenção para é, identificar-se essas, essas alterações feitas ao longo do tempo. Depois, um Hulkers, de 1646, alterado em 1780 por Tascan, com o pé de Luís XVI, então, é, e com joelheira, ela chama a atenção da joelheira, ela até mostrou que uh, a joelheira servia para mudança de registro. Depois foi um caso interessante do Cravo Blanchet II, uh, pertencente ao Kenneth Gilbert, uh, que originalmente era de Couché, em 1673, depois Blanchet Uh, alterou em 1757 e Tascan em 1778. E aí ela contou a história, quer dizer, estava é, numa uma casa em Paris da Madame Kinsky e é, quase que esse instrumento foi para o Museu do Conservatório, mas em 1806 o Querubini uh, resolveu uh, 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 leilão. Bom, e finalmente, nos anos 70, o Kenneth Gilbert comprou e usou muito em gravações e concertos, etc. Está no Museu de Chá. Depois, e ela lamenta o fato do instrumento não ter ido para o Museu Instrumental. Depois, ela mostra o Armand Louis Coupran e a mulher, e em cujo retrato a mulher aponta para o Blanchet, que teria, provavelmente seria o Blanchet, um retrato de 1766, e o Blanchet recém falecido. Depois, tem um caso muito interessante, que é um cravo de Gujon, de 1749, e uh, nesse instrumento vem escrito Hans Hookers Mefete Antwerp. É, então, é, ela, ela conta o processo, o Iber Bedard encontrou a assinatura do Gujon e, e constatou que esse cravo, na verdade, é um fake, é um cravo falso, 
feito no século XVIII, uh, como se tivesse sido construído por Hans Kukers. Então, é bem interessante, porque a gente acha que os, os, os falsos, né, os instrumentos falsos são só da nossa época, mas não, no século XVIII, os instrumentos dos Países Baixos, Rukas, sobretudo, como ela vem falando, eram tão uh, famosos e, 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 e valiosos, então o Gujão fez um fake de um Rukas. Bom, depois de entra o século XIX, ela mostra uh, que naturalmente o cravo não morreu, continua ainda a ser tocado por alguns músicos, mostra as primeiras publicações de Amédée Merot, a coleção Le, Le Clavecinis, de 1864, 97 e a coleção de instrumentos do Museu 1861, já publicada. Então, há um interesse nesse sentido. Depois, a publicação de Aristide Farrant, de sua mulher, é, e aí ela mostra uma, uma gravura super interessante do Lidie tocando em 1889, é, tocando o Tascan para um público num salão, é, depois menciona os pintores historicizantes, e depois os instrumentos uh, Errar, Pleiel e Gavô, no final do século XIX, e finalmente o Pleiel da Wanda Landowska. E ela termina dizendo que a gente não deve condenar a Wanda Landowska. Ela mesma, quando, quando muito jovem, ouvia a Landowska, não gostava, e que hoje em dia, naturalmente, reconhece o valor da Landowska. Bom, je crois que c'est ça. Uh, Florence, uh, excuse-moi se je fait quelque faute, <risos> mas já sei de ferro no dia. É, bom, minha gente, então, é, I think now we can uh, uh, go to the questions or comments. Então, vamos ver. Uh, Florence. Uh, Eu estou presente. Ok, je, 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 je sais de traduire le, le, la question. Euh, Clara Albuquerque, euh, claveciniste, elle est complète. Euh, sorry, euh, Clara Albuquerque, she's completely amazed with the representations from domestic lives with, with harpsichords. Euh, then Erasmus Strada, euh, euh, From Recife, uh, he asks, uh, uh, he asks if, if, uh, uh, could you, uh, uh, est-ce que tu pourrais recommander uh, any, any uh, publication with, with information about the, the measures of the original, uh, original uh, the keyboards preserved from the French historical instruments? Uh, I think what um, Emile Jobin published on the Thibault is quite important and it will be in the bibliography that I will give you tomorrow or very soon, uh, there is technical drawings available in museums. It means that you should write to the uh, different museums and for Thibault, you should write to the Parisian Museum, to documentalist. If you write to me, I can uh, create the contact with the staff in Paris, even if I am not working in the museum. And the best way is to buy the, the technical drawing of a Thibault, for example. And when there is a, such a document, it is very uh, secure and very secure. So I, I would suggest to, to do that. Uh, well, there, is oh, sorry. Yet, there is not yet a systematic catalog of the collection from the Paris uh, Museum, you know, unfortunately. We don't have a cost her for Paris, uh, a cost of catalog <laughs> for Paris. Ok. É, bom, eu, eu acho que eu não preciso traduzir para o Erasmo, certamente, mas uh, ela, ela recomenda o artigo do Emílio Jobin sobre o... o... Tibo. Ah, Tibo, pardon. E, e, e ela se coloca à disposição, viu, Erasmo? Bom, naturalmente, 
é, para colocar você em contato com os, o, as pessoas responsáveis nos, nos museus por essas informações e, naturalmente, os planos que os museus é, fornecem né, dos instrumentos. E, e, infelizmente, não há um catálogo é, com relação aos instrumentos franceses, como o John Costa fez. Agora vamos à pergunta da Luciana Câmara. Não, desculpe. Ah, agora o Erasmo, agora que eu vi que você já, já colocou a pergunta traduzida, então, <risos> ok. Uh, ok, uh, mais alguma pergunta, algum comentário? Ok. Uh, well, Florence, uh, uh, many many people saying thank you very much and uh, say telling how wonderful uh, is the course. Uh, Ana Cecília Tavares, bonjour Florence, je suis très heureuse de pouvoir vous écouter. C'est très gentil. Je suis touchée. <laughs> C'est beaucoup de travail. Il faut dire à tout le monde que c'est un énorme travail de préparer autant de documents. Euh, euh, bon, elle est disant que c'est un plaisir, mais j'ai beaucoup de travail de préparer tant de documents. Mais euh, Florence, je vais te raconter que Ana Cécile, elle était vraiment triste que tu ne pourrais pas parler en français. Ça a été son désir. Mais <rire> elle dit merci beaucoup. <rire> ok. Oh, oh, oh. Euh, en fait, ce que je veux dire, c'est que j'ai enseigné jusqu'en euh, 2016. Et depuis 2016, je constate que je ne peux pas prendre les mêmes, les mêmes PowerPoint qu'autrefois, parce que la recherche avance sans arrêt. Et il y a tout le temps plus de documents, et il faut remettre à jour. Et donc, ça a été finalement un énorme travail. De, de vous proposer quelque chose updated. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Il faut, il faut traduire. Bon, elle a dit que, euh, ela, até 2016, ela tinha os PowerPoints prontos para as aulas, né? mas que de lá para cá, muita coisa foi, foi descoberta, foi achada. Então, ela teve que atualizar o PowerPoint para mostrar para a gente com as informações mais recentes. Né? Então, isso é importante para a gente, né? indica uh, o quanto que a pesquisa caminha, né? o quanto que uh, descobrem-se novas coisas, etc. Né? Então, César Guidini, uh, he's a harpsichord maker. Uh, I would like to know if there is a book or publication regarding the de decorators of those antique instruments. I am preparing a book. There is, one, <laughs> there is one existing. It is not really a book. It is a, a three quarter of a book. It was published by Sheridan German already uh, uh, many years ago, uh, more than 25 years ago. And it is uh, all in black and white uh, uh, reproduced. So very hard to use and uh, Sheridan German only uh, studied uh, deeply the soundboards. Why? Because she was a painter herself of soundboards, historical soundboards. And uh, she published in early music uh, several very important articles uh, using the identification of the ends of the painters to attribute some instruments without a name. Uh, so what she did is absolutely important. But uh, in between, there was a PhD uh, written by a German uh, uh, man. Uh, the name is Belz, B-E-L-Z. And uh, my project, uh, I am working since years to build and uh, to, to, to make a book on uh, obstacle decoration, but really, Uh, to identify the painters, the motives, the teams, etc. So uh, 
if you like, I can put in the bibliography the, the, the few references on the subject, if you want. Bom, o César entendeu naturalmente e então para os nossos amigos que estão assistindo, é, ela, ela está preparando um livro sobre isso, sobre a decoração é, no cravo. É, eu vou mostrar para vocês... É, Yeah. <risos> Olha aqui, ela está preparando um novo livro, mas esse aqui é o livro mais recente da Florence, falei ontem, foi super premiado, Voir la musique, quer dizer, ver a música. Então, é um livro que, para encomendar pelo correio, é um pouco difícil, porque ele é bastante pesado, estou aqui fazendo um pouquinho de alterofilismo, mas é um livro maravilhoso, com uma iconografia fantástica, e então vocês podem imaginar é um livro realmente que vale a pena e aqueles que porventura viajarem e puderem adquirir é um trabalho maravilhoso um trabalho de décadas né é o it exists, Voir la musique it exists now since one year in Chinese the same <risos> então os chineses estão estão mais rápidos que os americanos então já existe há um ano em, 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 publicado na China, em mandarim, né, provavelmente. Então, é, é isso, eles estão, estão bem, bem à frente, né, os americanos. É, muito bem, minha gente. Uh, Florence, I, I think we can... Uh, uh, you can Schluss machen, wenn es dir recht ist. Ok? Ah, uh, 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 I think we, we, we can stop now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you so much. And we meet uh, once again tomorrow, okay? We, we meet tomorrow. Uh, eu queria agradecer muito a prof professora Florence Getro. Merci beaucoup, Florence. Thank you so much for all this uh, work, uh, for sharing with us so much experience and wonderful information and pictures and so on. Thank you so much. Queria convidar a todos e todas que estão nos assistindo. Daqui a pouquinho, às 17 horas, nós vamos ter o recital com os alunos. Essa é uma parte muito importante da Semana do Cravo. Aqueles que sempre acompanharam uh, no modo presencial, uh, nós sempre tivemos três dias de, de recital e essa foi uma tônica sempre da Semana do Cravo. Sempre recitar recitais com os alunos, né? Não importa se iniciantes ou, ou até o nível de doutorado, mas sempre os alunos das várias instituições brasileiras sempre foram bem-vindos e continuam sendo muito bem-vindos. A gente ficou muito feliz de receber muitos vídeos de vários alunos de várias partes do Brasil. Então, a gente vai ter é, vídeos, vídeos lindos é, com execuções é, de gente de, do Conservatório de Tatuí, da própria UFRJ, de Belo Horizonte, da Universidade Federal de São João del Rey. Peraí, deixa eu ver se eu estou esquecendo. Estou esquecendo algum, algum lugar. São, são 11 participantes, então um repertório muito interessante, cravos, ah, de Goiânia, alunos, alunos de Goiânia, do Instituto Gustavo Ritter, é, e vamos ter uh, gravações em cravo, espineta e no forte piano. Então, não percam, vale muito a pena. E, desde já, eu queria dar os parabéns aos meus colegas, professores, que enviaram os alunos, aos próprios alunos, que mandaram vídeos muito bonitos. E é isso, a gente se encontra às 17 horas. E amanhã, tomorrow, we meet for the third course with professor Florence Getro. Thank you so much, Florence. So, See you tomorrow. Yeah. Alors, même heure.